today we have Lance Tapley. Lance, turn around, please. Smile to the people. Yes, you know him as a reporter. He has been able to expose some of the horrible things that was happening at the main state prison in regards to solitary confinement. He did an excellent series on the Irving family and how they control the province of New Brunswick. I've known him in a whole bunch of different positions. He was also the coordinator of an event 40 years ago. And two great things happened 40 years ago. One was the beginning of the Common Ground Fair, and the second was a citizen's referendum to save Bigelow Mountain, to keep it from becoming the Aspen of the East. And Ken Spaulding, who was involved in that campaign, is also with him today to speak to you about history, and how history repeats itself. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. Thanks for coming up a little closer. It's helpful. Uh, and uh, we've got this right in the middle here. I like to look at people when I'm talking, but it makes it a little more difficult, but I'll, I'll try. Um, the Bigelow battle in the 1970s was, the, was a watershed moment, I think, for the environmental movement in Maine. Uh, and uh, for Maine, to some extent, uh, as, as a whole. Uh, in the 60s and 70s, uh, there was this big news story that, that the Maine's second mountain range after Katahdin was going to be turned into the Aspen of the East. The, it would be the biggest ski area in the East and one of the biggest in the country or the world. And, and uh, of course, everybody got behind it immediately, right? The, the governor, the legislature, the business community, etc. So for a while, it looked like this was a done deal. But uh, there was this undercurrent of uh, people who were concerned that maybe this beautiful 12-mile-long mountain range with 12 uh, gorgeous peaks that was part of the Appalachian Trail, the Appalachian Trail goes right over it, uh, didn't need necessarily to be given over to the jet set because uh, there was going to be a jet airport built alongside uh, Flagstaff Lake. Uh, there were going to be all of these expensive condominiums built. It was uh, a question of uh, whether uh, there could be an alternative, and the alternative would be preservation for people who like to camp and hike uh, and uh, ski cross-country. Uh, and in general, as we Mainers know, uh, enjoy the, the wilderness of Maine. So. Uh, I happened, I'm from Maine, but I went out to, to uh, California to work for a few years. And I was working uh, for the San Francisco Chronicle at the time of a big controversy out there. Uh, the Mineral King Valley in the Sierra, um, Walt Disney wanted to develop into a giant ski area too. And people became, con some people became concerned, in particular the Sierra Club, about uh, whether it should be uh, turned into a uh, uh, a giant ski area, or maybe it should be kept, again, for, for people who like other forms of recreation. As you know, downhill skiing has become a form of recreation that is extremely expensive now. Uh, so, it's, you know, to some extent this was a um, class conflict a, a bit, but it was um, generally um, a lot of average folks uh, against uh, development interests that had a certain clientele in mind. Uh, and. I saw what was happening out there. I also saw that California uh, had a real reliance in order to have reform on the referendum and the citizens' initiative process. The citizens' uh, initiative is uh, something that we've had in Maine since 1918. It was used very little until the mid-70s, until actually the Bigelow battle. And uh, it, it is when the people can go around the legislature and pass a bill by themselves. And now you generally see at least one or two citizens' initiative, as there will be this November, on every main ballot. Well, I saw that it was used a lot in California and to good effect in many instances. So when I came back to Maine, 
uh, in uh, 1972 or late 71, uh, and I saw this controversy emerging about Bigelow, you know, I said, hey, there is a way perhaps to get this settled, because it never would be settled other than to please business interests by the legislature. I mean, that's what the legislature does, basically. And I, as a person who, as a journalist who has covered the legislature for many, many years, I can tell you almost categorically that's what the legislature thinks its role is. That's categorically. I mean, there are obvious uh, exceptions to that rule. The legislature does some good things for the people in general. But this is a this is a problem in our democracy. Democracy. We used to have, in high school, in the high school I went to in Maine, a class entitled Problems of Democracy. And believe me, there are many problems of democracy. And this was one of them. Uh, anyway, so I propose to the conservation groups, the hiking groups, like the Appalachian Mountain Club, uh, the uh, Maine Appalachian Trail Club, and so forth, that we, we f initiate a bill, put it on the ballot, uh, and convince the people of Maine to vote for it. You initiate a bill by collecting a large number of signatures. Uh, we had to collect, I think it was 42,000, a little over 42,000, uh, and in the end we collected well over 50,000 to put it on the ballot. Um, and there was, it was a hard-fought campaign. It was big news for several years, the biggest news story in Maine for several years, uh, and we won. The people of Maine voted to preserve this very large mountain range voted to preserve 40,000 acres. Uh, and it was a close vote because we had the business community, uh, we had the, most of the new newspapers, we had the governor with a, at, the, at the end with a news conference every day uh, uh, attacking us. Uh, we, we had a lot of people we couldn't get the message to because we simply didn't have the resources. So there were a lot of um, obstacles to overcome. But we made it a true grassroots campaign, and that's one of the advantages of collecting all those signatures, and the people responded positively. But I'm not going to go into more about the history of that battle. You can, you can read about it uh, on the web to some extent. But I wanted to say a, a bit about what I learned, and Ken Spaulding here, who was a comrade in arms uh, during that battle in 1974 to 1976, uh, Ken uh, can tell you about it too. We want to talk about lessons that, that we have learned uh, and we've also both of us participated uh, in other environmental bat battles since the mid-1970s and, and there are many lessons to be learned but I, I can only hit a few uh, now. Um, first, the first lesson is citizens initiatives and referenda which is when the legislature sends out a bill uh, can be very useful for uh, getting something done by just calling upon the grassroots. And you will find, the polls show this, that many, many uh, actions by the legislature are not supported by the majority of people in Maine. They, they tend to kowtow to the lobbyists representing largely corporate interests that are, that are around them. Um, two, this is another important lesson that we learned. Environmentalists in particular should not fight defensively on corporate turf, which means the issue isn't necessarily when something is going to be decided about the environment or on many other issues in Maine. It isn't necessarily an economic issue. Uh, it, it, uh, is, um, uh, it is important to understand that people, human beings, people in Maine, value other things besides economics. Okay? For example, they value the, the, the woods, the wilderness, the, the lakes and ponds and mountains too, and keeping those for other than corporate development. Okay, this, this, is, this is something that people should keep in mind. We went to, to Maine people and said, look, you're going to lose a big part of your natural heritage here, uh, and this is your chance to have your voice uh, be clear on this. This was a big Massachusetts development company, which made it a little bit easier to argue against uh, uh, since it was an out-of-state outfit. But, but of course, much of de the development of Maine, much of the ownership of Maine rests out of state. Um, and out of the country, too, now. Even more so now, it's out of the country. Um, also, we made our pitch to working people. Environmentalists are somewhat marginalized by, uh, by I think, a lot of corporate propaganda, because uh, by uh, saying that uh, environmentalists are the elite. Okay, we 
I'm not, I came from a working class family. We're not the elite. We, environmentalists, people who care about Maine's environment, are all over the place in terms of what kind of background they come from. Um, we went to the fish and game clubs, the conservation clubs. We went to the unions, okay? We got a lot of support. Uh, and they, are, they weren't, at that time, enemies for sure, uh, as, they, as they are supposed to be now. Uh, and I'll just have a little bit more to say about in the future. Um, we also discovered that there can be conflict between grassroots groups like the one Friends of Bigelow that we represented and mainstream environmentalist groups. Uh, and I, I just can give you a wonderful example of that. The, the mainstream environmentalist groups, some of them, some of them are, are uh, very uh, purist in their intentions and actions, but, but uh, some of them can be compromised. And their, in, their inclination is to compromise with corporate power, basically. That's what they're, they're um, uh, used to doing. These are their friends. Uh, so they talk to them and they try to effect some kind of compromise. So there was a lot of talk as an alternative to the Bigelow Preserve Bill, which was, you know, 40,000 acres, a fairly big chunk given, given over to public ownership, a chunk of Maine. Uh, there was some talk about having maybe just 12,000 acres, maybe just have a um, smaller ski area, et cetera. There were all of these compromise proposed. And a number of the truly elite environmentalists in Maine uh, supported that. So we had to fight that particular issue. Uh, the head of the president of the Maine Audubon Society at the time, her husband owned, her husband's corporation owned a quarter of the Bigelow Mountain Range. Uh, that was a big problem when Ken was sent to, as our executive director in charge of the signature gathering campaign, was sent to uh, uh, have an office in the, I mean, he was sent to uh, the Maine Audubon Society because the Audubon Society director had said we could have an office there, just a desk there. Uh, he was kicked out by when she got wind of it uh, because uh, there was this uh, rather big conflict of interest. Okay, citizens, initiative and referendums, useful tools, don't fight defensively, pitch to the working class as, as well as to everybody else in the state, um, and understand that you may fight a conflict with uh, the uh, uh, people who are truly the environmental elite. Um, but there are caveats that I want to make to those points, okay, because history has given us more lessons to learn. Um, big spending now to, by, by uh, powerful economic interests is much more the case than it used to be. And we're talking about millions of dollars uh, uh, potentially. I was involved with a banned clear-cutting effort in the 1990s, and this would have restricted clear-cutting all over the state in a very important way. Uh, and this, this bill, Jonathan Carter was the leader of that, but I was the treasurer and, and sort of co-leader uh, or in the leadership of it. And, and, I mean, the amount of money that went against the banned clear-cutting effort was, uh, was phenomenal. In, in the 1980s, the nuclear referendum, uh, the anti-nuclear referendum efforts uh, were defeated by a huge amount of money. Uh, also spent by Maniac and its corporate cohorts. So that is something that is new. Um, initiatives also can have counterproductive consequences. Uh, we didn't, uh, but uh, for example, uh, they have to be thought out. They have to be somebody who, or people who are wise in the political landscape of what's happening or about to happen in the next few years have to be consulted. If you want to start an initiative campaign, you, you ought to uh, talk with a lot of people. Uh, the, the, I mean, for example, if you think uh, Paul LePage is an anti-environmentalist governor, then uh, maybe, maybe it would be a good idea not to encourage, as, as was done uh, a few years ago, to have an anti-bear baiting uh, measure on the ballot when Paul LePage is on the ballot, because it brought out droves of people who, who were hunters, who didn't want to have, have any restriction on hunting. And so they tended to vote, and this has been pretty well shown uh, for, for LePage. The bill on the ballot uh, this November, which is an anti, uh, is a gun control bill, that's, on, that's a, an initiative that's on the ballot, um, that is going to bring out a lot of people, I predict. 
uh, to vote for Donald Trump. Uh, so, and he is not known as a particularly uh, environmentalist type. Uh, he, he uh, you know, denies that, he says global warming is a hoax. He denies global warming and, and I could go into other issues. But this is, it has to be something that is, is thought out if it's something that you're, uh, you're planning. Um, as I alluded to, working class people have been convinced after 40 years of corporate propaganda, which didn't exist in the mid-70s. I mean, this was not the conviction of working people. They thought of themselves. The, the hunters and fishermen called themselves the, the first conservationists, okay? Uh, now they've been convinced that environmentalists are a part of this liberal elite, and, and uh, it has been done through a great deal of propaganda over many, many years. So this is something also that would have to be confronted right now. Um, also, uh, and this is something that we're learning at the moment, um, see that little flag up there, Save Bigelow again? Uh, this relates to that. Uh, you have to maintain constant vig vigilance after a victory. Uh, and the legislature can the Bigelow Preserve Act by itself. Okay, it's, it's a law, it's not part of the Constitution. You can't initiate a piece of the Constitution. So it is um, it's something that you have to watch carefully, and we have. We've been involved, uh, both Ken and I, and many others, in the planning process for the Bigelow Preserve Bill, in the, or, or rather for the implementation of the Bigelow Preserve Bill. And, it, and uh, it's been a long, you know, 40 year battle, basically. And uh, uh, it's, uh, that, that flag is up there because uh, we're concerned about the overcutting of the preserve. In order to get working folks, and we, we sincerely didn't want to put people out of work, to, to um, uh, vote for the bill, we said, look, we're going to allow some timber harvesting in the preserve, and, but it has to be very tightly regulated. Uh, the, the communities in that area, they, they rely on, on uh, logging jobs. So we wanted to have that uh, uh, allowed. Uh, we allowed, and I, I might mention also, um, hunting in the preserve. Uh, and uh, we allow, there is restricted snowmobiling in the preserve. These compromises, you know, enabled us, this, this pitching to the working people in some ways, enabled us to get the bill passed. I, I think it was very important to do that. And if you look at Bigelow now, except for this threat from overcutting uh, of the forest by LePage's administration, uh, it, it's pretty much the same as it was. We didn't want a big overdeveloped state park. We wanted basically this area to be left alone and it pretty much has been been left alone. But LePage, uh, you know, he wants to please his, his corporate friends and I mean you can see how I feel about our governor. And and, uh, and so he, he's been pushing this overcutting. So uh, we replicated something we did to start the Bigelow campaign in 1974, a, a publicity stunt. So some of us uh, went to the top of Bigelow in the middle of winter, climbed to the top, and planted a flag that said, Save Bigelow. And I have a picture. I, I finally dug out a picture. It's definitely got an archaic feel to it. I'm going to have to get a new print made. But this is us in 1974. Uh, that's me holding the flag there and my wife behind me and, and uh, other friends of Bigelow. Uh, there were nine of us, including a reporter, Bob Cummings, who was the great environmental reporter of the 20th century in Maine. And uh, he took the picture. And uh, some of us, including Ken, went up to the top of Bigelow in June to commemorate the 40th anniversary of the, uh, of the Bigelow uh, vote, uh, the successful vote to preserve the mountain range. And we planted another flag. This was a protest to the, to the overcutting that we were afraid would uh, uh, hurt the preserve. Now, the conservation commissioner, when the news came out, um, said, well, we've done all the cutting we're going to do on Bigelow. So, you know, I like to think that maybe we had some effect by this bit of uh, pressure on, on, on his administration. Uh, anyway, this was a publicity, by the way, another lesson of, of uh, the Bigelow campaign, uh, publicity stunts uh, help a lot. You can, you can get a lot of mileage from uh, interesting news media events. Uh, and this was definitely that. But it was a very sincere 
uh, move. I mean, we wanted to save the mountain for the people of the, of the state. That's what we said we were doing. Um, I have given a little bit of uh, what I've learned in succeeding years uh, from that battle. Uh, and uh, I mean, from other battles as well as what I've learned from that battle. And I, I want to have questions uh, afterwards. Uh, and we can have a little discussion about uh, the environmental movement. Um, but um, Ken, I wanted Ken to supplement, correct me if I'm wrong on something, uh, supplement what, uh, what I've said, because he was there at the beginning. He's also, Ken Spaulding is a, uh, one of the principals in Restore the North Woods, which is, has been attempting for years to get a large national park built in, uh, or created in, uh, uh, in and around uh, the state park, Baxter State Park. And I think that as a result of the conversations that Restore star started a good number of years ago, uh, a move toward that eventual goal, a big one, has taken place with the creation uh, through the uh, generosity of uh, Roxanne Quimby, uh, the national monument that uh, was donated to the to the, to the federal government and to the people, and uh, President Obama recently uh, proclaimed. Uh, so that, he can tell you more about that, but Ken's group, I think, has to be given a lot of credit for really starting the, the conservation. Ken also supervised the, the collection of signatures, uh, and we made a, we also did something historic at that time. We, you, you see those people who collect signatures, uh, at every time you go to the polls now for initiatives, we started that. Uh, and Ken was in charge of organizing that. And uh, so we've had, uh, we've had a collaboration. It was fairly close in the past and every now and then since. Uh, and it has been a great ride, 40 years of working for Maine's environment. Uh, and uh, we, at least I plan to continue. I'm sure you plan to continue too. Uh, so let me, let me let Ken describe his, his experiences uh, after and in, in the Bigelow campaign, if you'd like, uh, and uh, we can then let you folks um, add to it. And uh, uh, I hope that we'll have a good conversation. Thank you. I'm not going to actually say a whole lot about my role in the Bigelow campaign, but I, one thing I did want to say is the environmental movement, or probably any movement, uh, very few times you could say that there was an individual who. who Made something happen. It's usually a group effort. Um, you know, it's usually hard to figure out who started it and, and you know, who played the most key role and all that kind of stuff. Uh, the Bigelow Preserve uh, campaign was a little bit different in that Lance was the one who started it. Lance the one who saw it through. Lance is still involved, in it. and uh, that's, like I said, that's unusual, but that's the case. And actually, because I was in charge of getting the volunteers, we we did all this in four months. Um, and we started it out, I, I was at the time working at a fire tower, and uh, they they hired me to, to essentially collect the signatures. Um, I came off my mountain in the uh, second week in October, and we had, had only a few weeks until the election, which is where nowadays we know that that's where you need to collect the signatures if you're going to have a referendum. Um, you have to get them at the polls. It's the, the easiest, most efficient way to do it. But we didn't really know that then, but we did collect half of the signatures that day, and then the rest took another three months to collect. Um, so because I was coordinating the volunteers, a lot of people, you know, those thousand people, think of me as the, the, the person who did this. You know, and, and I just want to clarify that Lance uh, was the, the motivation and the, the energy behind creating the Bigelow Preserve. Um, a couple of things he said I want to comment on. I also want to mention the Natural Resources Council of Maine. You didn't mention them as being a good point. Uh, and, and I mentioned that only because I was the, the uh, chair of the Maine Mountain Committee in our state at the time, and Lance came and gave a presentation to us. Um, they were important for natural, natural resources. In, the, in that campaign. Yeah, yeah they, they were very important. The, 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 the NRCM at that time was organized a lot differently. It was a council. It really was a council where the, the uh, people who were on the board, uh, where they are representing all different agencies uh, or, or organizations, um, as opposed to a board of directors, uh, which is what how most organizations are. Uh, the other thing, well, he, he mentioned elite, elitism, and calling 
environmentalists uh, elite, and especially uh, people who wanted a big old preserve as being elitist. And it made me think of a, a battle that was much more recent where the main Hudson Trails, uh, I'm not even sure if they had the name that, at that time, um, wanted to do some grooming with snow machines across the Bigelow Preserve uh, for skiers. And we, you know, the preserve really didn't allow for that. Um, the, there's supposed to be snowmobiling on designated snowmobile trails, but there wasn't supposed to be a mechanical grooming. And then it doesn't specifically say that, but the wording doesn't allow for it. Um, so we were at some hearings to in the legislature because they wanted to change the law so they could do this. And we did end up with a compromise that allowed them to be, do a little bit of that in one point of the preserve. But what struck me about this elitism thing is that they were, here, here we were, you know, but collectively the people who were there for Bigelow weren't, weren't making as much money as any one of the, the board members of the Hudson Trails were making. They were, you know, vice presidents of uh, LLB and, and BIW, and, and they were calling us elitists. Uh, you know, there were these people who had condos up there for Sugarloaf, and it, it was just pretty ironic. That, and they were getting away with it uh, because because we wanted to ski without grooming, and somehow that made us uh, It was just an um, I thought I'd talk a little bit about uh, what makes uh, a campaign successful. Um, and I'll, I'll tell a few stories about some successes and some failures. Uh, the Sort of the key points, and, and this may seem obvious uh, to people who have done this sort of thing before, or maybe I'm wrong, one or the other, but you, you have a chance to tell me which. Um, first thing is to know what it is you want. You know, it's pretty easy in the Big Old Preserve, you want to just, you know, protect the mountain, preserve the mountain, but it's not always that clear exactly what, what it is you want. You need to figure that out first. And then you need to know who is it who makes the decision to get you what you want. You know, is it the legislature, is it the governor? Um, or is there some other route, some other, is it an agency? What do you want and, and who's going to make the decision to, to, to get what you want? And then you need to find out what it is that motivates that person or that body or the, the people who are the key players uh, in that body. Um, and you need to find a way to give them what they want. It may have nothing to do with what, with, uh, what it is that you're after. Um, but you need to know that. Um, and. Then, and you need to know what it will take to get them, you know, it's, it's related to what they want, what it, what it takes to, for them to say yes to what it is that you want. Uh, and maybe the voters in the state of Maine, you know, Maine, who's making the decision could be a lot of different things that I'm talking about as a person, but it doesn't have to be a person. That usually is not. Also, know the opposition. Who is it who is going to be opposing what you're doing? What are the resources they have? Um, what kind of power they have, what relationship do they have with the people who are actually making the decision on this thing. Um, so you need to know who the opposition is. Uh, Lance talked about all the people who opposed us, but one of the uh, one of the very fortunate things about that campaign was that there, there, were no, there was no really organized opposition that put a lot of money into it. Uh, the Bigelow campaign was run on a shoestring, and in the, you know, there weren't all, all these kinds of uh, TV ads opposing what we did. I mean, the governor came out against it, but you know, so we held a couple of uh, news conferences and said, "I'm, I'm against it." it that's, not the, that's not what you really need to, to kill a campaign like that. So we were really fortunate. That, and another thing I might mention about that is the Bigelow campaign would be very difficult to replicate today um, for a number of reasons. But and that's one of them. Is that there was no organized, well-financed opposition. Um, but another one was just the, the times when it was the first modern referendum issue, that, and, and we didn't have to put a lot of money into it. You know, it, was a, it was really a grassroots effort, um, and there wasn't a lot of money being spent opposing it. So it, it would be hard to replicate that today because referendums are much more common. Uh, it's usually opposition that's well financed. It would just be hard to do that. I uh, need after you figure out who the opposition is, you need to put together your plan and you need to implement it, and you need to keep a sense of humor because in the environmental movement, you know, sometimes you don't always win, uh, not right away. Uh, as will be evident from what I'll tell you about the story. I'm going to give a couple of examples that were uh, very successful 
that are not exact, not at all grassroots, but but it is a way to get something that, that you want. In both cases, it was a, a government or a pseudo government agency that decided it wanted to get something done, and then put together a. In both cases, it was a, a task force. It was sort of a not a sham because the people who were on the task force didn't know what it was they were going to decide. But the agency that put together the task force knew what it was they were going to decide. Um, in one case, it was another time when Lance and I worked together. Uh, Lance, in this case, was actually my boss's boss. It was with the Maine Health Systems Agency. Um, and Lance was a policy coordinator. And uh, Tom Andrews, who was, was later to become a congressman, was the uh, community health uh, coordinator. And I was the environmental health coordinator. And this was another quickie, it was when, another time when it was uh, during the winter between my fire tower jobs, but in about four months or five months. Um, what we knew was that uh, the state needed an environmental health agency uh, unit, health unit, and we needed a cancer incidence registry so you could just figure out you know, where there were cancers and, and then, then from there why, and then maybe find out, you know, do something about it. So that was the result that, that uh, we needed. To do that, we put together um, an environmental health task force, a health and hazardous waste task force, uh, pulled together the people who we knew needed to be in on the decision. And, and this was the same thing with, with another agency. Maybe I put them together since the strategy was the same. Um, I was assistant to the commission of the Department of Conservation. And we decided that we needed money to buy land. Um, so we put together the Governor's Commission on Outdoor Recreation in Maine. Um, and we pulled together the people that, that some of them who we knew that if they weren't involved in, the, in this task force were going to oppose what we wanted to do. What we wanted to do turned out to be called the Land for Maine Future. Um, and uh, so we had this, again, I was working full time at this point, but we had almost a year of this task force getting together, figuring out why we're having all these problems uh, you know, with. Uh, losing access. So hunters, we need to involve hunters because uh, they were they would be a key in this. And, and their problem was they were losing access to land. Um, we needed to involve um, fiscally conservative legislators because we wanted some money. Um, and so these were all brought into it. And, and I don't remember all the people who were on the Health and Hazardous Waste Task Force. I do remember that uh, Lance brought in a speaker once who, a guy who I'd never heard of, but Lance said, well, he's up and coming. He's going to be a big, uh, you know, big decision maker in the, in the uh, Republican Party pretty soon. So some, I don't know why we thought, thought uh, Jock McKernan was going to be an expert on health and hazardous <laughs> waste, but, but uh, he came in and gave a talk. And, and you know, so the, the key here was that there were agencies. They knew what they wanted. They figured out who the people were who were going to be making the decision. Um, or would be possible opponents, brought them in, uh, what's the word, coordinated, um, basically put together a show that would that would allow these people to make the decision that what you wanted was what they wanted. And uh, then when it came time to make the decision, it was pretty easy. In the, in the case of, and, and that didn't even need a, a not the Health and Hazardous Waste Task Force didn't need another effort, it just went directly to the legislature from this, the land for Maine future. At the time, we didn't think um, government agencies could be involved in referendums. Now we know through the Bayer referendum that they can because the IFW, the Inland Fisheries and Wildlife, did participate in those. But at the time, we didn't know that. So Department of Conservation stepped back and, and all, virtually all of the uh, environmental groups and the hunting groups, the snowmobilers, all came together to help get LMF, the land for the future, perhaps $35 million the first one. Um, I remember a, a meeting, I won't say who it was, but someone who was uh, high up in state government was part of this, um, this first meeting of the all the uh, environmental groups and others who were going to help get this passed. And he said, uh, I think we need more than the, the number on the table is $35 million for the first bond issue. So I think we need more money. We ought to go for 50, 75. He said, "This task force—they didn't, you know—they didn't discuss 
you know, they, they didn't consider very much how much money we needed. So let's just do more. And I said, we may not have, the, the task force may not have, have uh, gone into a huge amount of depth about the exact dollar number, but it, would have, it, will, it was more than what we're doing tonight. And if, if we up it, we're going to lose those people who we cultivated who had a tough time getting the $35 million. They're the fiscally conservative legislators on the appropriations committee. Um, and so we stuck stuck with thirty five million, and, and you know that took an effort, but it was a huge success. And so these are easy examples because there, there's a lot of staff, and there's money behind these. And what we do is, is a lot harder. Um, and I'm going to talk talk a little bit about a failure. Uh, I was uh, chair of the Sierra Club, the main group of Sierra Club, uh, back in the '80s, and. George Mitchell, who I had, had been the um, coordinator of the, the group, or the chairman, whatever, the group of uh, um, environmentalists for Mitchell in his very first campaign for the U.S. Senate. And so I thought I had a good relationship with him. You know, um, you know, we, we did quite a bit to help. Um, but he introduced this legislation to, to fix the boundaries of Acadia National Park. At the time, the bound, there were no exact boundaries of Acadia National Park. They could accept land or buy land anywhere in Hancock or Washington County and become part of Acadia National Park. The towns didn't like the uncertainty of that. They wanted to have fixed boundaries, and they didn't want them to be very big. Um, so they went to George Mitchell when he, during his first term in the Senate, and he introduced legislation to fix the boundaries. Um, and if you look at the boundaries now, it's nothing at all like being all of Hancock and Washington County. It's very, quite small. Sierra Club found out about this when it was still, when it was not public, but there still wasn't a whole lot of time left uh, to deal with it. We, of course, thought there should be more land in, in the park than what was contemplated by Senator Mitchell. Um, so the mistake that we made was that we didn't identify, well, it, it would have been hard to, to accomplish no matter what we did, but, but the mistake was we concentrated on the la what land should be in the park that wasn't in the boundaries. And we built a case for why that land should be within the park. Well, that reasoning had nothing to do with the decisions that were being made about where the boundaries were supposed to be. The, the decisions were being made by the local governments that either wanted something to be developed, not developed, uh, or they you know, had somebody who owned the land who didn't want it to be in the park. But whatever it was, it, it wasn't about the value of the land. So uh, we did not win. We did not get anything out of this. Uh, George Mitchell's campaign, or staff, said uh, we asked him to meet with him. He wouldn't meet with us. Uh, said if, if you can work it out with the municipalities, then we'll accept what you want. Well, we knew they had no reason to give, give away anything. Um, but a mistake was we made, we should really have at least met with him, I think. Uh, but we had no staff, it was all volunteer, there wasn't a whole lot of time. We didn't think it would, it would be worthwhile, but in retrospect, we probably at least should have done that. Uh, there's some, some ugly circumstances around how, around that whole battle, too, in terms of how we were treated uh, by uh, Senator Mitchell and, and his office. Uh, but I won't go into that right now. Okay, one, one other example. For, it, I work now for, I retired from the state, I work for uh, Restore the North Woods um, for the last 13 years. And it's an example both of success and failure. The, the failure is that we've been working for 22 years to uh, get a national park, a 3.2 million acre Mainwoods National Park in preserve in, in uh, Maine. Um, and we don't have that yet, so that's sort of a might say that's a failure. Um, a success is that there was just named a na national monument in the Maine Woods up by Baxter State Park, which we actually didn't work on um, directly. However, uh, it never would have happened if we had, didn't have our campaign. Roxanne Quimby, who's the one who bought the land and, and uh, gifted it to the government, um, learned about our park proposal. In 19, it was initiated in 1994. She learned about it in 1997 at our booth at the Common Ground Fair. Um, decided that it was a great idea, that it's something that she could do to get back, and she got involved. Uh, she was on our board for a little while. Um, when, and we helped her uh, 
uh, research and, and uh, acquire some land, uh, none of which is in the preserve in the uh, monument now. It was in other places. Um, she then sold her business, Burke's Bees, had a bunch of money, started some some nonprofits of her own, and basically decided that she didn't want to advocate for a national park. She wanted to go out and buy one and uh, and make it happen and actually do it and do what she what she could. And she couldn't buy three million acres, but she could buy a hundred thousand acres. And so that's what she she did. Um, we stepped back during that their campaign for that because we were uh, let's see we weren't really well liked up in the up in the Mil uh, Greenville Millinocket area. Uh, people didn't there were a lot of people who didn't like the uh, idea of the three million acre national park, and so they were saying. Roxanne Quimby's proposal was only a way to get to the bigger park. And so we didn't want to confuse things, so we tried to be very quiet while they were getting their campaign. So we didn't do that work to get the monument. But again, it never would have happened um, if we hadn't been, been advocating for the larger park for a long time. One of the things I want to, want to say about sort of the strategy is that there, so many times I've been involved with with uh, issues, with legislative issues, where environmental groups negotiate themselves down before they even get to the, what they're going to present to to whatever body it is. So, um, you know, they say, "What do you want?" Well, this is what we want, but uh, that's not. People aren't going to accept that. You know? It's it's not going to be re they won't be seen as reasonable. So let's let's promote. You know, let's figure out what's reasonable and then and then present that. See if we can get that. Um, as opposed to proposing a 3.2 million acre national park, which all the mainstream groups said, that's totally unreasonable, it's not going to happen, we're not going to work on it. Um, but eventually it will. Um, and, and Restore the North Woods, the way we generally operate is that we do things, advocate for things that we think are right, um, and it should happen, and don't think so much about is it reasonable, or we just think that it should happen, and so we'll work for it. And, um, and then generally, we're not a big group. We're only, we do have some staff. We have three part-time staff. Uh, but we, we work on it until eventually it becomes reasonable. And then the other larger groups step in, and they kind of carry the ball across the goal line, if you will, or whatever analogy you want to use. And that's what happened with the monument, pretty much. Um, in the history books, we probably won't get a mention, but it never would have happened without Restore. A couple of other instances of that is uh, listing the Atlantic salmon on the endangered species list and the lynx on the endangered species list as threatened. Uh, that's, both of those were instances where virtually everybody said, you shouldn't do that, don't rock the boat, um, it's going to create havoc. And we, but we petitioned the um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in both cases. Um, eventually they got the ball rolling. They pretty much had to do it because it was clear that that uh, these species need protection. Um, and when it became more clear that it was more of a moderate uh, approach, then the other groups got involved in it. And it couldn't have happened, they wouldn't have happened, there wouldn't have been as much protection if they had gotten involved. So it's a good thing that they, they do. Uh, but that's just another way of, of approaching uh, trying to get something done. And I think I'll stop there. Thank you, Ken. Let me just make a couple of points based on what Ken said, uh, and then we'll see what you have for questions. Um, I might mention, of course, that uh, there have been successes uh, using uh, the people's vote in, in, as an initiative or referendum measure. For example, clean elections, public financing of elections in Maine was originally passed in the 1990s through uh, a, an initiative bill. Um, Right after the June 8, uh, 1976 vote for the Bigelow Preserve, the people of Maine approved the bottle bill in the, in the fall. Uh, and uh, referenda for um, money for the land for Maine's future have often been successful. And there, so there have been, you can use the people's vote uh, and have success in various ways. Uh, you know, initiative and referendum being the yeah, being my, my the two. Point was that you couldn't use a referendum, but just that you can't do it without any money. Anymore. 
Yeah, I think you're right about that. Uh, it, it, uh, that is unfortunately the, probably the biggest development is the infusion of big money into, into politics because people, and the reason, people rely upon the media to get their information. Uh, and uh, they get those ads poured at them. Uh, I think you're seeing it now, aren't you? A certain number of political ads. And, and, and so that, that is the biggest problem. I wouldn't say that it couldn't work in the future, but it would have to be done very uh, carefully the, in a populist environmentalist campaign. It would have to be done with a lot of foresight. It would have to be done with a lot of preparation and, and with a lot of um, uh, colleagues from the environmental groups. Um, I think right now, by the way, that such groups as Audubon, uh, which were pretty conservative back in the 1970s, have become m more, uh, shall I say, fervent, more energetic in, in trying to, to stop some of the, the uh, worst excesses of uh, corporate development. For example, the, the effort right now to uh, restrict the overcutting of the forest, which is not just on, on the Bigelow Mountain Range, but all over the state of the public lands uh, that the LePage administration has been pushing has been, has been strongly uh, opposed uh, by Audubon and um, the Natural Resources Council, which had to be sort of dragged over years to oppose nuclear power, it has been you know, somewhat recalcitrant on a number of issues, nevertheless has been very good and strong on issues. For example, the, the mining proposal that uh, the Irving Corporation, the um, uh, uh, one of the major Ir Irving corporations proposed uh, for Bald Mountain in Aroostook County. That's been strongly opposed by Audubon, by the Natural Resources Council, by many other groups, as well as there, as a populist uprising uh, in Aroostook County and other places. And that has been defeated in the legislature. They're going to come back again, uh, potentially, because LePage just keeps pushing and pushing and pushing uh, on that issue. And this is a very large corporation, but even the legislature was, uh, was uh, responsive uh, to this issue. Uh, and so, so it is possible to have populist environmental movements. It is possible to get the mainstream environmental movements to, to join in this. And I think that I wouldn't want to rule out, even though big money is still a, uh, a huge player now in every kind of political campaign, I wouldn't want to move out that a grassroots effort, effort couldn't uh, uh, succeed. What happened, by the way, you might wonder, to the main health systems agency that Ken and I work for, um, Ronald Reagan came to power. And bang, that was it. There was no more health systems agency. He de defunded them nationally. So I make that point because you have to look at the big picture of what is going on. I, uh, I'm in favor of, pers this is personal, there's nothing to do with the issue here. I'm in favor of controls on guns, okay? I think they're too big a, 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 a implement for destruction in our, in our society. But I think it was just crazy to have that uh, referendum occur uh, in November. Okay, to have that initiative, I mean, that means the signatures were gathered and it's been put on the ballot for November. Because I do not think that, among other things, uh, again, another personal point of view here, uh, that Donald Trump will make America great again. I'm extremely afraid of him. Uh, I think he's a, a, a sociopath. And, and I just, I feel that, that uh, it, this vote uh, on... Um, Gun control will bring out a lot of gun people who, you know, pro-gun people who would, might not even vote otherwise. And it looks now like the second district, uh, the rural second district, is going to go for Trump, regardless. A big effort will have to be made to prevent that from happening. And that's at least one electoral vote uh, in the electoral college because in Maine we split uh, the congressional electoral votes. Maine and Nebraska are the only two states that do that. So this is. <coughs> You know, look at the big picture before you jump into something. And, and the bear baiting situation was similar. I think it helped uh, elect Page. So what's the commonality? Can somebody tell me what the commonality is be between the uh, bear baiting referendum uh, in, in 2014 and this year's gun control measure? They seem quite different, right? They're both initiatives, but... Other than that, what's their commonality? 
Yeah, but they were my well. What I wanted to say was that uh, that's for sure. But uh, they were financed by by people out of state. Bloomberg is behind his or any anti his pro gun control organization is behind the uh, uh, referendum this year uh, uh, to control uh, guns in, in various fashions. So you've got some billionaire in New York who says, "Let's do this this in certain states, okay?" And I don't know what their cogitations were, but all of a sudden we got this referendum because the people who collected the signatures, that was all organized, not with a grassroots effort. Oh, well, plenty of Maine people support that effort. And the bear baiting referendum, similar. Many of us don't like bear baiting either, okay? And, and uh, it could have been a, a grassroots effort, but maybe it wouldn't have been wise to have it on the gubernatorial ballot, okay? Uh, but this was also done uh, by the uh, Washington-based animal rights uh, group, the Humane Society, okay? Uh, I, I know that for a fact because I happen to be in the conversation with uh, some environmentalists and, and, and humane, uh, the Humane Society uh, director from D.C. Uh, to about this, what, what was happening, uh, what they wanted to do. So it was a definitely, this is something that has to be considered in terms of the, you know, any kind of, I think any kind of environmental effort or, or any kind of political effort that you want to organize, you have to look at the big picture here. And I think that's, very, that's real important. But let's, let's hear from you. Yeah. Um, when you said that uh, this designation wouldn't have happened without the groundwork that you laid, could you be more specific about well, what the, kinds the, of things? Yeah, the main thing was that, that if we hadn't had a, um, a table here, a common ground fair, and Roxanne hadn't had, happened to see it and then become involved through that, um, she would not have pursued it. And so from that perspective, and there were 10 years or so that we were kind of her support um, in, in what she would, her efforts in making this happen. And I, and I just want to say that he's being modest. And I, I think they had an enormous influence on, uh, on the, the conversation. They started the conversation about preserving a big chunk of the North Woods. Uh, and and it just wouldn't have happened. Uh, I mean, it wasn't just that. I think that chance occurs occurs was was important when she came to your table. But you've gotten up poll after poll, for example, which which have demonstrated to people that uh, in Maine that the majority of Mainers support a national park or a preserve. I mean, that's that is in fact the case now. You hear a lot about the people in Millinocket. Uh, but in fact, all the polls have showed that, I think it's overwhelming, uh, people in Maine support uh, a preserve and park. Including northern versus southern. It's, um, it's always been the case. Every legitimate you know, um, poll that has been done shows that Maine people, that the majority of Maine people support the Maine Woods National Park and Preserve. Or, you know, every, polls don't always ask the same question. It might be, you want a lot of land preserved or whatever. But, all of the polls that ask those sorts of questions, including specifically about the, our proposal, has been positive. But the difference is that if you ask, you know, take a poll of 100 people or 1,000 people, whatever, the people who tend to support it say yes. They, they say, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Good luck. But if you have 1,000 people in that poll, there are going to be 15 or 20 who say, over my dead body. I mean, they're passionate in their opposition because they are totally opposed to public land of any kind, uh, especially the federal government. So it, it's not just a matter of the numbers, um, it's a matter of the passion and that has made it politically you know, toxic, essentially. We're from Canada, uh, so... Uh, oh, we're from Irving, then. Uh, 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 you're from New Brunswick. So we're from New Brunswick. Are, uh, yes. We'll get, tell, you a, I'll tell you a short success story. Uh, we're from the Kingston Peninsula. We're from the Kingston Peninsula, which is north of St. John. Uh, uh, and uh, they were, Irvings, were going to spray us with Roundup because they had done a giant clear cut and they wanted to kill the, the hardwood. Uh, we, uh, we met with them, or they started by having a meeting 
and we have seen this for pipelines and a couple of other things. They have meetings where proposer uh, has a whole bunch of experts and they talk and then meetings over. The locals don't get to talk. Uh, uh, but a bunch of us got together in a corner and said uh, we didn't want to get sprayed with Roundup. Uh, and we put, we got a bunch of groups together, uh, a bunch of people together. And to make a long story short, we got four, four minutes on the national news. And the one thing that Irving does not like is public, publicity. And we, they gave complete, we got no clear cuts, uh, no, no spraying of any kind, no clear cuts bigger than five acres. Uh, and you can win. But, but you can only win if you get your community organized. That we had a community meeting of about 170 people, and nobody was in favor of being sprayed. Another point is it's never over. No. Um, like we may get a na national park. You'll, we'll still have to have a friends group that's going to monitor everything. You know, it'll be a lot easier to try and get the park service to do something nice than it is to get Irving to do something nice. But uh, it, it's still it's never over. You know, I'm never totally, totally winning. Yeah, thank you. So, are you talking about the citizens' initiative process really moving from being citizen initi initiated to what we have now, where the majority of the initiatives are really out of state funded? Is that something that's happened because of legislation changes to the process itself, or is that something that's happened just because the way the national groups are organizing? And do you see any way to address that so this just doesn't get used as a way to get through legislation that couldn't otherwise get through the legislature that they just throw an ad campaign on and well, get a bad bill? Well, of course, the referendum process is about getting something done that you can't get done through the legislature. It just wasn't envisioned, I don't think, that the you know the large groups have a lot of money. I, I, but I don't think it's a change. I, I think the reason that it's being used now is because they can see that, that this is some, if you have a lot of money, that you might be able to win. Um, and so it's a, it's a way for other people besides, you know, totally grassroots to get things done. It's not, it's not necessarily, I don't think it's necessarily bad to have wealth. Um, it's not necessarily bad to have an out-of-state group bring a, an idea to, to Maine to put on a referendum. What's bad is if both sides can't be heard and so that the, the people can make an informed decision. Uh, that's that's the, that's the hard part. Uh, yeah, I think what's happened uh, also is that there is a, um, of course, big uh, change in America from the 1970s to now. There was TV advertising then, but now advertising on television and in every other medium, the internet, of course, now uh, it has become a bigger phenomenon in people's lives. There's more mobility, less community. Uh, everything seems to be mediated. That's what that's what media uh, bring, and so in order to have the media, you have to have a lot of money. I mean, in order to influence it. Plus, over 40 years, these things have all seemingly occurred over 40 years that I'm talking about. Income inequality has meant that a huge amount of money has gone to the top. So they tend to get what they want, even if it's good. I mean, uh, I mean, Bloomberg is financing uh, this uh, gun control measure, for example. Um, it's uh, you know, if you can, if the the groups, the environmental groups that have a lot of money, the animal rights groups, which of course have grassroots components too, but they get a lot of big donations uh, from people who can afford it. You know, sometimes they work out very well in terms of what. Uh, I would like, for example, uh, but sometimes they don't because that money uh, can be used in very repressive, conservative uh, uh, ways. And, and uh, I'm just waiting, uh, unfortunately, for corporations to really get behind their own citizens' initiatives. Uh, I mean, they do to some extent now, but I mean, they could do a lot more because people are so attuned to the media. And I think. I think it's still possible to run grassroots outfits. I made an argument for that today. Uh, but I think that it is harder. And um, there need, we, need to have, um, we need to have more grassroots fundraising uh, in imaginative ways like Bernie Sanders did. Okay, Bernie Sanders 
not only was good at the, I mean, his campaign, good at the technical aspects of collecting all that money, but he, you know, he latched on to a true grassroots uh, movement, uh, upset with the establishment of the Democratic Party and upset with what had happened to America, upset with the fact that they are coming, you know, a lot of people are coming out of college with tens of thousands of dollars in loans that they don't know how they're going to pay back and so forth. So you've got to be attuned to the big picture, as I said before, in terms of what people are really upset about and, how, and what they really value. And it's not just on the corporate economic turf. I made, uh, I, made, I made that point. And then you've got to be imaginative in raising money, which you can do through the internet, obviously, now. So, you know, there is some hope there. Uh, and I think it has to do with uh, a lot of wise, shrewd um, political uh, calculation, and it has to do uh, with understanding how to raise a lot of money, too. Uh, and it can be done. Bernie Sanders, $27 average contribution collected, I think it was close to 10 million of them. Uh, and that's a lot. He was collect, out collecting Hillary Clinton and all of her establishment connections uh, over uh, in some months, which is amazing. Uh, so, you know, there, there is some hope there for what can be done. We may be, maybe we're at an exhaustion point with media too. You guys here, Anybody really in Maine it, uh, would be astonished if you don't know it, and most people in Maine don't know it, uh, at the um, control that the Irving corporate empire uh, has in, in New Brunswick. They own literally all the newspapers. They do. Yeah, and I mean, we're talking about over 20 weeklies yeah. and all the dailies. Uh, there's a French language newspaper that they now distribute, so they have some control over it. That's the only one they don't own, but all the English speaking dailies. And they employ one out of 10 people in New Brunswick. Uh, I mean, directly employed. And so it, it has been called by a Canadian Senate committee, uh, a, a extraordinary outside of, of a, a dictatorship in the third world. I mean, it's just the most unbelievable situation. They're moving into Maine. And I wrote a series for the Maine newspapers on this. They're moving into Maine. And according to some people, they already have this kind of control in Aroostook County. I mean, they were the biggest landowner in Maine, uh, and they they have a lot of control in uh, uh, in 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 politics too. Now they have a big influence, uh, certainly on the governor, and they have a large number of people in the Republican Party who support them in what they want to do in mining, for example, or in terms of timber harvesting. So it's a uh, there are two big corporations. I mean, it gets complicated, but but they're all uh, one entity in the end. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Very good conversation.